me back here to get the camera to work. <laughs> All righty. So I can bring this back here. And there we go. All righty. Welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living. Uh, I'm Scott. I'll be your host for the next oh, 10, 15 minutes. Please keep your hands and arms inside the sanctuary at all times. Uh, as we get started today, I would like us to always uh, take a moment and welcome Zoomers. Um, I would like to take a moment to set your intention, to get a little centered, and to put in your thought either a thought of your father, a man who was influ who influenced you well, or just a general honor of positive male energy and freedom. Because I did a little bit of research, I have been becoming kind of fascinated with where holidays come about. We have all these holidays, and we all just kind of accept them, but I don't think we necessarily know about them. So today happens to be two holidays. Uh, it is Juneteenth, and it is, of course, Father's Day. And I have about oh, a minute on each one, and I thought it was important to share, especially Juneteenth, since it is a relatively new holiday for us. So, Juneteenth, which is short for June 19th, is a celebration marking the moment in 1865 when enslaved black people in Galveston, Texas, found out they were free, which was more than two years after President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. It's also known as Emancipation Day, Juneteenth Independence Day and Jubilee Day. Uh, a little bit more information on it. On June 19, 1865, approximately 2,000 Union troops arrived in Galveston Bay, Texas to inform the enslaved African Americans of their freedom and to tell them that the Civil War had ended. Led by Major General Gordon Granger, who had fought for the Union, the troops took control of the state and announced that the 250,000 enslaved black people in the state were now free by executive decree. Uh, Juneteenth has been celebrated annually in the African American community since 1865. It is considered. <laughs> uh oh, that was not what I intended to do. Uh, that's not what I intend to do either. <laughs> Where's the one? Scott, set your That's why I'm not the only one. <laughs> 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 oh, I know, I'm looking for a participant. Oh, there they are. They're over there. Oh, they keep running away. Come back. Be proud of who you are. Okay. It won't do it. All right. Well, if you're on the Zoom line, just mute yourself for right now, please. Uh, let's see here. Juneteenth has been celebrated annually in the African-American community since 1865. It is considered the longest running African-American holiday, but it only became a federal holiday last year. Uh, Texas, ironically, was the first state to designate Juneteenth as an official state holiday in 1980. Uh, President Biden last year signed the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act, formally recognizing Juneteenth as a national holiday and as he did so, he said, great nations don't ignore their most painful moments. We come to terms with the mistakes we made, and remembering those moments, we begin to heal and grow stronger. Uh, Juneteenth, incidentally, is the first new federal holiday since Martin Luther King Day was established in 1983. So there's your uh, trivia for that. And as for Father's Day, I'm glad it's not just me having problems here. Right there. Oh, no, I did, but... Yeah, you have to mute this, uh, the laptop over there. This one, too? Yeah. Your laptop, you have to mute it. There. No, they won't take me. I think it... <laughs> <laughs> you know, we play Twilight Zone here more often than we play spiritual music. Uh, maybe it is a form of spiritual music. <laughs> no, it's still doing it. Why? My mouse disappeared again. I know, that's what happens. Oh, and here comes the third member of the We're Trying to Figure Out Our Act crew. <laughs> <laughs> but the mouse disappeared. Okay, yeah, well. I can do it. That's okay. There's the mute, there's the mute. Okay. Anybody else? We've got room. We, I mean, there's space up here. Encore, encore. <laughs> At this point, we're just trying to get a core. We don't, we're not even looking for that. Okay, got it. <laughs> there we go. Now we can do it. There we go. But I gotta get all this other. Oh, there's mouse. That. That. Just. 
general shortcuts are all gone and we have a giant screen. <laughs> How many religious scientists does it take to get a PowerPoint presentation out? <laughs> okay, just a touch about Father's Day. Uh, July 5th, 1908, a West Virginia church sponsored the nation's first event explicitly in honor of fathers. It was a Sunday sermon in memory of the 362 men who had died in the previous December's explosions at the Fairmont Coal Company, but it was a one-time commemoration. It was not an annual holiday. The nation's first Father's Day was celebrated June 19th, 1910 in the state of Washington. Uh, in 1924, President Calvin Coolidge urged state governments to observe, observe Father's Day, but it was a long way coming. Um, it ca actually came as an offspring of, uh, as an offshoot of Mother's Day, which we celebrate today, which had its originals, its origins in the peace and reconciliation campaigns of the post-Civil War era. Uh, thanks in part to an association with retailers who saw great potential for profit in the holiday, Mother's Day caught on right away. The campaign to celebrate the nation's fathers did not meet with the same enthusiasm. Perhaps because, as one florist explained, fathers haven't the same sentimental appeal that mothers have. If we had one of those trumpets, we'd go wah, wah, wah. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Many men, incidentally, continue to disdain the day, as one historian wrote. They scoffed at the holiday sentimental attempts to domesticate manliness with flowers and gift giving, or they derided the proliferation of such holidays as a commercial gimmick to sell more products. Here's the important part. Often paid for by the father himself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> during the 20s and 30s, a movement arose to scrap Mother's Day and Father's Day altogether in favor of Parents' Day. That didn't take because during the Great Depression, uh, it was derailed in an effort to combine and decommercialize the holidays. Struggling retailers and advertisers redoubled their efforts to make Father's Day a second Christmas for men promoting goods such as neckties, hats, socks, pipes, and tobacco, golf clubs, and other sporting goods and greeting cards, none of which interest me except possibly the greeting cards. Uh, when World War II began, advertisers began to argue that celebrating Father's Day was a way to honor American troops and support the war effort. And finally, uh, believe it or not, the holiday did not become official until 1972, uh, when Richard Nixon signed a proclamation making Father's Day a federal holiday. Today, economists estimate that Americans spend more than a billion bucks each year on Father's Day gifts. Uh, slight trivia in other countries, especially Europe and Latin America, fathers are honored on St. Joseph's Day a traditional Catholic holiday that falls on March 19th. There you go. And now you know. All right. <laughs> By the way, when there's other music, these are in the back. I was just having a blast while you guys were performing up here. This is the extent of my musical prowess, but it's fun. All right, so let's uh, move forward into the service now. Uh, together we will all say the opening, the first part, and then turn to somebody else and say, oh, goodness. Well, you can say, oh, goodness, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness is always fine to say, but I need to move that. All right, together, we are a welcoming community where the vibration of love lifts us, the wisdom of the ages inspires us, and the science of mind teaching empowers us. Turn to somebody else and say, I honor the path that brought you here this morning. Okay, you can see our weekly, <coughs> excuse me, our weekly schedule. Um, all, almost all events are on Zoom, um, so we can just slide right by that and we'll move forward to Louise uh, unleashing. Now this thing decides to come down before Releasing everything. Your creativity. There we go. Thank you, Louise. Uh, uh, that. Um, and that'll be on. No, that's what we did yesterday. Oh, that's what we you did, did yesterday. yesterday. Okay. So those, those are, are two examples. Yeah, who did those two? Louise and I. Okay, those are great. Louise, have you ever thought of becoming an artist? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there might be, you might have some opportunities in your future. Okay, uh, Primetime Health, the next edition, uh, which is led by Heidi Collingwood, will be Saturday, June 25th from 10 to 11.30. Uh, workshop three is moving waste from your waste. 
Um, so, <coughs> discovery class coming up. If you are thinking of becoming a member, and I will honestly say, as I think several other people in this room have said, that becoming a member of this organization has been one of the most uplifting, fulfilling uh, decisions I have ever made. So I heartily recommend, it is open, it is non-judgmental, it is my extended family next to my official family who is sitting in the back of the room. Um, but this is, if you are considering it, Angelica will be leading a class. Uh, please sign up at the back table if you will be attending. Uh, it's just a great, a great organization to be part of. Writer Studio continues on June 28th uh, from four to five o'clock, led by Lorna. That's been an ongoing class now for probably about three or four years. So I don't think we need to add more to that. Uh, Visioning, led by Rick, will be on June 29th, our president. Um, I have been to both of them. They're very enlightening. And we learn a lot about directing the direction. That's from the Department of Redundancy Department, uh, which is an old fire sign theater joke. I won't have it. Uh, that'll help us lead the direction of the center. Did you wish to say anything, Rick? No. OK. Oh. All right. Uh, moving up, bookstore special. Most faded cover books are 25% off. Make sure to have a look after the service. Mm -hmm. And then the little pantry needs to be fed. It looks like there was a shipment of stuff that was brought to our little pantry. Uh, it needs more. We are taking care of our community, especially in times like these, uh, where the community needs additional help. And I think that's it, short of getting this recording. This Do I do a recording now, or just? We'll go to the next slide. Well, I know that. But Yes, right away. So hopefully we've been recording since five to ten. Oh, we yeah. have. <laughs> <laughs> what you can't see, we don't have applause signs. Uh, but he has his sign that holds up and says, "Record, record." Okay, so let me. <laughs> that's wonderful. Did you do it? Uh, well, no. I'm trying to get the mouse to work. Okay. <laughs> All right, our theme for the month continues to be body. Our contemplative meditation this week will be led by Susan Hess. Where did you go? I'm hiding. Oh, you're hiding. <laughs> <laughs> With music by Jackson. So we'll hit that. Oh, for goodness sake. There we go. And Susan will come up here and take the platform. Jackson will perform music. By the way, Edward, <coughs> Edward Les and myself will be taking our oral panels next week. Uh, we will be moving from APs, which are almost practitioners, to PPs, which are potential practitioners. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for pending, our pending practitioners. What was it? Pending. Pending practitioners. OK, that'll work. Pending practitioners. OK, Susan, it's all yours. Good morning, everyone. And good morning to all of you on Zoom. It's nice to be here. Um, my contemplative reading this morning is um, from Deepak Chopra's Creating Health. And I invite you to just settle into your chair. After the reading, there will be a minute of silence, and then Jackson will take us into the service. So. The mind-body connection is real. The proof is a flood of messenger molecules, barely understood before the late 70s, that course through the bloodstream, transforming our most intimate thoughts, emotions, beliefs, prejudices, wishes, dreams, and fears into physical reality. Mind turns into matter, not at the high point of a magic act, but as the ordinary business of the body's 50 trillion cells, you cannot experience the faint, faintest mood without your heart cells sharing it. And at the same time, your lungs, kidneys, stomach, and intestines. These organs participate in your mental life as fully as your brain does. When the message coming from the central nervous system when the messages coming from the central nervous system are changed, then the body has no choice but to change too.
The greatest thing in my life is knowing my connection to the power and the presence of the one. And I know this power and this presence runs through every person here, every person attending on Zoom, the community, the world. We are all connected to the one source, the divine inspiration, the creative energy. We are all part and parcel of it. We are each, each unique indiv individualizations of the whole. And I celebrate this uniqueness. I celebrate our oneness as well as our our differences, knowing that within there is the same heartbeat, the same light, the same love. And so I simply let this light and this love expand out, touching all that I meet today, knowing that hearts touch hearts, minds touch minds, and eyes connect through eyes. And so I simply let this service unfold in its right and perfect way because I know that the message from Reverend Angelica we will touch us, touch us in a deep part, raise our consciousness, raise our level of awareness, raise our hearts. And so I simply let this be, knowing that my divine connection, that your divine connection, the divine connection we all have is within, without, and is all there is. And so it is. I want to serve service to this community community I welcome Reverend Angelica <laughs> you. so you did uh, very well thank you so much for your words you know it's interesting when the practitioners uh, create the contemplatives there's a lot of research to do I mean, they have to figure out uh, what's the month about, what's the day about, you know, and then find something that goes with that. And they do really well, don't they? Mm -hmm. And Jackson always finds the perfect music to surround it, to unfold it in. So I'm really happy about that. And so good morning, everybody, everybody here and everybody online. I wanted to start this morning uh, because of we do have two holidays. Somebody printed this on the minister's list yesterday, and wait a minute, my glasses are still fogged up from wearing the mask. Hold on a minute. Okay. Uh, I wanted to share this piece about Father's Day. Are you ready? So today is for the fathers. It's for the grandfathers, uncles, brothers, friends, and sons for the most important man in anyone's life, the one who gave us life. Here's to you, the dads who play endless games of go fish with their kids and always let them win. And those who always played to win every time thinking that their children would grow stronger through defeat. This is for the fathers who worked in fields and factories, taught in classrooms or sat in office cubicles eight long hours a day. Here's to those who performed life-saving surgeries and those who drove their truck through long days and nights. Here's to those who loved every minute of their labor and to those who only worked so their families would survive. To the sleepless dads who have waited in silent fear that their babies wouldn't make it through the night or their teenagers survive their first time driving alone. Those who lost children and those who found them in different ways. Here's to tears not shed 
and hugs not given for appearing weak. Here's to dads who built it with hammer and saw and those who wouldn't know how. The fathers who are afraid of spiders and yet can slay the greatest dragon of fear in their little ones. The fathers who tried and those who didn't. The fathers that gave us life and walked away and those who stayed long past the life of their marriage to give something to the children. Here's to the fathers who loved their children's mother and to those who no longer could. The fathers who hurt because their children have been kept from them and those who have been both mother and father. Stay at home dads and stay away dads, the one we wanted but never knew. The helpless hurting father and the brave strong one and for all the ways of fatherhood, here's to you. So to all of our men in the audience, both online and here, happy Father's Day. Now, we're working on the body, and here is a phrase that, and of course I can't find the, I need my, oops, no, no, no. Well, it does, even though you can't see part of it, it says the body remembers what the conscious mind chooses to forget. And I had asked a question last week about how many people have had a massage or some sort of body work and found themselves wanting to cry during that body work. And one of the things I learned when that happened to me one time was that memories are stored in our body not just in our brain, but in our whole body, just like the piece that Susan read today. <clears throat> Clarissa Pinkin Estes, who wrote, um, ah, there's the mouse. Now I can move it down here. Who wrote uh, Women That Run With Wolves and a few other books. She says, the body remembers, the bones remember, the joints remember, even the little finger remembers. Memory is lodged in pictures and in feelings in the cells themselves. Like a sponge filled with water, anywhere the flesh is pressed, wrung, even touched lightly, a memory may flow out in a stream. It makes us feel kind of um, uh, strange having this Sunday be about the body when it's also a celebration of Juneteenth. Because what I know through the Hawaiian teachings is that yes, everything I've experienced in my particular lifetime is stored in my body, but so are the ancestral uh, memories. And so I've, my heart just goes out to the African-American communities who have experienced or their ancestors have experienced the things that they experienced. You know, uh, I don't remember what movie I was watching, but I remember being so horrified, uh, and I've also read about it in books, being so horrified at how uh, white plantation owners, let's say, uh, treated the people that worked for them as if they were animals. They treated them even worse than they treated their dogs. And that, you know, it's really hard for me to understand how we could be like that. But yet there's all levels of consciousness, aren't there? So um, you can imagine what the cellular memory, memory must be like for African Americans. And so I honor them today on Juneteenth. And then I was reading something on Twitter that um, the man, uh, I can't remember his name at the moment, but he played in Star Trek and he's really active on Twitter uh, the Asian man, he's talked about living himself 
in a uh, uh, internment place uh, during World War II and uh, what they went through. And I thought, what the hell is wrong with us? And I remember walking out of the movie Dances with Wolves years and years ago. I, I don't want to see that movie again. It hurt so badly to be in that theater and, and watch what was happening. And I, th I thought then, I walked out of that theater angry at white people. And what really bothers me is that I saw a program by Bill Nye the Science Guy, and I mentioned this before, who says that the only reason anybody is any other color is because of skin protection from the sun. We were, we started in the center of Africa, humanity did, and that's really hot sun, so we needed to be, we needed to have a lot of melanin in our skin to protect us. And then some of us traveled up to the colder countries, and so slowly we got rid of it and became white and ended up with blue eyes. But, you know, it's, it's and over the years, the centuries of us thinking that we were different, our bone structure even changed. So when we stop and think about we're all one, we all came from the one, I mean, not just spiritually, but physically, there should be no discrimination at all. But yet we're, we, we, we tend to discriminate about everything. We discriminate about people that have been to college and those who haven't. We discriminate about lots of things. And all of those things that we, those barbs that we give out starting as children stick in our bodies. I remember uh, going through some pictures of myself and looking at those pictures and thinking, gosh, I was pretty, but I never thought I was. I thought I was too tall since I was 5'8 in fifth grade. I was too tall. At that time, I was way too skinny. Uh, you wouldn't know it now, but <laughs> way too skinny. And so, you know, it was, uh, you know, the bean pole kind of thing and, and all these things that were said that stuck in my body as a little girl. So even when I got into myself, uh, you know, after my, in my late teenage years and started, you know, really, I had really long hair for a long time, you know, got into my hippie years and everything, and I'm looking at these pictures and going, this is really a pretty girl. And I feel like I wasted that whole time because I didn't believe it from something that happened when I was young. So things get stuck in the body. The, um, so not only do they get stuck in our individual unique bodies, but they get stuck in the collective body. You know, when we go back to our teaching, there's only one mind, that, there's only one life, that life is God's life, that life is perfect, that life is my life now. There's only one mind, that mind is God's mind. That mind is the mind I am using right now. So everything you are thinking, everything I'm thinking, everything that we've allowed, the little barbs that we're still having in our bodies, etc., because of things people said during, the, during our lifetime, those are not only in us, but they're in the one mind. Maybe what we're going through right now in the United States, for instance, and in other places in the world, is something so that we can begin to remove those barbs, where we can begin to realize that 
There's only the one life where we can let go and surrender to the oneness that is the truth of us. I wanted to share a story with you. So a physician who specializes in mind-body medicine shared a story in a lecture about a woman he once treated. Wait, let me, let me stop this share for a minute. Okay. A physician who specializes in mind-body medicine shared a story in a lecture about a woman he once treated. She had severe, almost debilitating pain in both of her arms and had been to many different types of doctors with no relief or explanation for her symptoms. She finally came to this mind-body specialist and he guided her in a process that he used often. The doctor often worked with imagery using a guided visualization process to connect with the body and listen to what it has to say. As the doctor guided the woman through the process, she said that she imagined wrought iron bars clamped down on both of her arms. The doctor asked her what those bars wanted to say to her. Though it felt odd, she asked out loud what they were there for and what they wanted her to know. And at this, she was immediately flooded with memories of her grandfather. He had been a stern man and had died about a year before her pain began. She had been, she'd taken care of him in his final years, but never felt loved or appreciated. He had been harsh and difficult throughout her life, and she always thought it was her fault that he was this way, rather than just his personality. Since his death, she hadn't liked to think about him. Caring for him in his passing had been painful, stressful, and she had tried to put it from her mind. And in putting it from her mind, she buried it in her body. After more guided processes, she came to understand the emotional pain behind the physical pain in her arms. As she worked with it and eventually resolved it, her symptoms were alleviated. The trauma and pain that she didn't want to work with in her mind showed up in her body, and by becoming aware of it in her body, she was able to heal. I have a personal story about this as well. Uh, for it seemed like all my life I was clumsy, tripping over things, falling over things, falling over my own two feet, or falling over things that weren't even there. And uh, at one point, I mean, this lasted all the way up until when I started to go to the Glendale Church of Religious Science. And I had, uh, a few times in a row, slipped on some stairs or something and hurt my tailbone. And it was really, really, really painful. And I went to... Uh, I, the Glendale Church was, the minister was Dr. Leo Fishbeck, but his wife was also a minister, Elizabeth Clare, Reverend Elizabeth Clare. So I went to her and asked for her to treat for me. And the, when, after I had told my story, she said, what are you punishing yourself for? And I thought, punishing myself? And then I realized that I kept falling on my butt, you know, and hurting myself. And I thought about, you know, that was a common occurrence when I was a kid. I got punished for just about everything, even things my little sister did. But I thought, wow, so what is it about me that feels like I need to be punished? And I realized that it was, set, it was I had embodied this idea that I couldn't do anything right. And in this... Uh, therapy session that I had with her a few times in, in spiritual mind treatment or I would, it wasn't therapy it was counseling and then spiritual mind treatment I realized hey I'm, I'm living on my own I mean I'm in my 30s early 30s I'm living on my own you know I'm doing good things there's nothing to be punished for and I started releasing and forgiving my mother. And as I did that, I no longer fell. I stopped falling. 
So it was like I had to, uh, I had to figure that out. As I, the first slide said, that the body remembers what the conscious mind forgets. The body remembers what the conscious mind refuses to think about anymore. We stuff it. So, oops, I'm trying to change the slide and I realize I don't have it anymore. So let me go back to share. <laughs> Share. Okay. Now. Come on. Let's go to the next one. Oh, come on. Why doesn't it want to move? Maybe it's not a good idea to shop. Oh, here we go. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> There we go. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't. I only have two here. So Wayne Dyer says, begin to see yourself as a soul with a body rather than a body with a soul. Right? A soul with a body. And to me, the one way, you know, if the consciousness is what is embodied in every cell and atom of our body, then we have to work with the consciousness in order to move out of that sort of thing. So I love this picture for one thing, but I also like what it says. Your body's ability to heal is greater than anyone has permitted you to believe. And so I'm gonna take us through a little guided visualization. So if you want to uh, get comfortable in your seat, allow yourself to close your eyes. And first of all, take a deep breath. Feel the sensations of the breath coming into your body and the breath going out of your body. <clears throat> Feel the sensations. Of anything that the breath touches. Allow yourself to come to a nice, safe, peaceful place within you. And with your next breath in, I want you to feel a feeling of peace coming all the way down into your feet. And if there is any tension there, let that breath just help that tension release. And if there's something that the body wants you to know, let yourself let that message come up in any place we touch as we go through this meditation. I know that our ability to heal is greater than we could possibly ever imagine. And I also know that in the science of mind, we don't have to go back into the situation and dig it up. We can acknowledge it, release it, and replace it with something else. So breathe in peace and breathe out any tension. Breathe in peace and allow it to be in your ankles and your lower legs, your knees, your thighs. Breathe in peace and breathe out any tension. And if there's a message, let it float up. With your next breath, allow yourself to breathe into your lower torso. Feel it in your buttocks, 
in your lower stomach. Feel all the organs in your stomach relax and soften. <coughs> breathe in peace and breathe out any tension. And with your next breath, bring that breath through your upper torso. Fill up your lungs, fill up your heart, your kidney, your liver, all the organs, all the cells. Breathe in peace and breathe out any tension. And with your next breath, allow yourself to feel this relaxing feeling, this peaceful feeling go through your whole spine. Feel your shoulders dropping. Feel any tension around the muscles of your spine relax and soften. Breathe out the tension. Breathe in peace. And with your next breath, bring that feeling up into your neck and your head, your face muscles, your jaws. And feel it also in your arms and your hands. And breathe in peace and breathe out the tension. Take another deep breath and feel that feeling go all through your body from the tips of your toes to the top of your head and the ends of your fingers. And now, without getting into the emotion, if there is any message that came up for you, acknowledge it. and let yourself release it on the next breath. It no longer has to be a part of you, whatever that was. And with your next breath, remember the truth of your being, that every cell and atom of your body, that 70 trillion cells that make up you, they're all God. There is nothing but God. And allow yourself to think of this truth that you are a soul with a body. A soul, an individualized expression of the one. And with your next breath, I want you to feel grateful. Feel grateful for being in this body. Feel grateful for all the experiences this body has had since the beginning. Even those ones that were uncomfortable. You have now let the uncomfortable go doesn't mean there won't be uncomfortable later. But now we know how to move through it. We know not to let it get stuck in our bodies. We feel it and let it go. We feel it and surrender it to the one, that one power that is greater than anything we could possibly ever imagine. And so I celebrate us and these amazing bodies that we live in. And I know that not only does the body remember those barbs and things that we talked about earlier, but it remembers the joys. And that we do not have to release. 
Joy is the infallible sign of the presence of God, as Teilhard de Chardin says. So we feel the presence here, now. And take another deep breath and allow yourself to be grateful for this releasing experience, for this acknowledgement and release. Knowing that from this moment, we can step out into our, the rest of our day, the rest of our week, the rest of our lives, fear free. All of those barbs have been removed. And I know this as well, that if we find one that's decided to come back for any reason whatsoever, we know how to release it, acknowledge it, surrender it, and be grateful. With your next breath, allow yourself to come fully back into this body, sitting in these chairs, present here and now. And when you're ready, open your eyes. And I know for each one of us that in some way, we have recovered parts of ourselves. And it is good, very good. And so it is. <sighs> Your body's ability to heal is greater than anyone has permitted you to believe. So let's say this affirmation together. And we're not going to do a treatment because we just did one with the process that we did. But let's say this affirmation together. The lightness of being fills my body as I breathe in the joy and the love of spirit. I honor the uniqueness of all beings. And so it is. So we have a gift of music from Les this morning. So I saw... I was going to say I'll stop this chair, but I'm afraid I won't be able to get it back again. <laughs> is this going to be a, an original? No, this is a Cat Stevens tune. Oh, thank you so much. Let's give both of them a hand. I might not like it, so I would hold your applause. Sure. When Cat Stevens wrote this song, he put so much compassion into this dialogue between a father and his son. And I was hoping that we here could use this opportunity to hear that compassion and to treat for peace between families and between the generations, knowing that the central fact of that relationship is divine love. So Les is doing two parts, the father and the son in this conversation. <clears throat> Oh, when you found something 
So with a grateful heart, I acknowledge the source of all our good. I know that the universe is a generous gift. That's what you got. It's the best gift. And it gives according to our level of acceptance. So I know for us individually and us as both the Ukiah and the Eureka Center for Spiritual Living, that we're open, open arms, open hearted, open and ready to receive. Good is just pouring in on all of us. And how grateful we are that spirit gives without judgment, without conditions. It just gives. So I know that because we're made in the image and likeness of spirit, we are spirit in form, then we are the same way. We give without conditions or judgments. And this is good, very good. We're grateful for our abundance, and so it is. So, who would like to come up and read the uh, our statement of in oops, go back our statement of inclusion? I can do it. Great, thank you, Louise. Our resident artist. Yay. <laughs> no, you are, because you, you sell. People know who you are. <laughs> okay, we, the Eureka and Ukiah Centers for Spiritual Living, are communities that celebrate diversity, foster inclusion, champion inner work, and create space for brave, vulnerable conversations. We are communities that honor the unique emanation of God that each person embodies, and advocate with people for human rights and dignity for all. We are communities that bless each other, see sacredness in all life, remain learners and listeners so we may grow together, and understand that oneness is not sameness. We know our beloved community is revealed more fully when we love each other well. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so it is. And so it is. And that Ladies and gentlemen, is the end of our service except for our wonderful band.